Well, welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Can you believe that we are to celebrate the Resurrection Sunday in an atmosphere like this? You know the cool part about the resurrection? It's not bound by geography. It's bound where our heart's at and what we believe in Jesus Christ. And we're glad that you're with us today on Easter Sunday. Uh, we want to thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to have a time of remembering Jesus in just a few moments. And so you'll have an opportunity to partake of the elements of the bread and the juice at home. And uh, Brad will walk us through a meditation of that. And as far as giving back to the Lord, uh, it's still about giving Him the first fruits of our lives. And so you'll have opportunities, and uh, you'll see that on the screen, of opportunities to give back to God. And, uh, but right now, I'd like to just um, have a time of prayer. You know, one of the things I want to pray for is the fact is that during times like this, uh, the enemy is going to try to steal, kill, and destroy. And you probably have tasted a little bit of that strategy in your own home. Tensions probably have risen a little bit. Uh, Your patience is probably waning a little bit. So I'm just going to have a prayer of patience and focus as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for all that you have done, Father, as we prepare our hearts to remember what you have done, that we don't let the distractions of the world uh, crouch in on us, Father, that we stay focused on Jesus Christ, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Father, and we also help us to prepare our hearts for a time of worship as well. Father, that it's all about you. Our lives were given over for your glory. And again, we thank you for this day. But Father, may we realize that every day in the life of a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is Resurrection Sunday. So we thank you so much and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Welcome to Resurrection Sunday, church. And while the location may have changed in the way you take these elements, the power remains the same. You see, this is a time when we can clear our hearts of any distractions and focus in on what God and Jesus Christ have done, have done for us. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, feel free to join us in this time of remembering. And when your heart is ready, please partake in the elements together. You see, I was looking at all the wonderful things that Jesus did throughout His ministry. You know, He was born of a virgin. At the age of 12, He was able to debate religious leaders. He performed many miracles. He lived a sinless life. He spoke with authority. And He died a painful death. But none of that would have mattered if He had not been raised from the grave. You see, we find this story in John chapter 20, verse 1. I want to read it together. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. You see, Jesus rose from the dead, and... In doing so, he set up a new covenant for his people. He set up this direct line of communication that we now get to partake with God each and every day in our lives. You see, this Sunday is a wonderful Sunday. We should never forget Resurrection Sunday. But now every single day we have is Resurrection Sunday. Every day we wake up, we have a Resurrection Sunday. This new covenant covenant where our sins will be forgiven, our inequities will be forgiven, never to be remembered, to be drowned in the sea of grace. And how amazing that is. Isn't it amazing to think that God has given us such grace today? And we need to remember that on this Resurrection Sunday. And remember what Jesus Christ did for us. Not only did he bo- was born of a virgin, able to uh, debate religious leaders, perform miracles, speak with authority, lived a sinless life, died a painful death, but he rose again. And he rose again to give us the eternal life where no longer do we have to worry about these hurts and these habits and these pains these sufferings that we go through on this earth because one day we will get to dwell in the house of God with Him. And what a glorious time that is. So on this day of Resurrection Sunday, let's remember that He rose again to set up a new covenant with His people. And that pe- those people are us. And let's pray. Father, we just thank You so much for today. We thank You for Your Resurrection Sunday, Father, that not only is today Resurrection Sunday, Father, but every day is, Father, that You set up a new covenant with us that we can now partake in Your 
your blood and your, your, your body broken for us every single day, Father, that we can commune with you, that we can come to understand who you are and what you do in our lives, Father, every single day. And we have a direct line with you now, Father. And Father, I just give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. Today at Resurrection Sunday, I'm going to be walking through the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, probably the most powerful chapter on the resurrection there is. 
And in a time in which we're going through right now, uh, we need some encouragement. We need some assurance because we're hearing the word death over and over and over again. Matter of fact, we're m- having it measured in our country of how many deaths occur each and every day. And so what I'm going to look at, if you would take your Bibles out and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's the Apostle Paul talking to the church of Corinth, and he's dealing with some issues that they've had, and he has some questions. And so, but I want you to kind of learn a little bit about the background of Corinth. Corinth was a Greek city, and the Greeks did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Matter of fact, when Paul preached in Athens about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know what they did? They laughed at him. They laughed at him and said, you've got to be kidding me. There is no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. Matter of fact, most Greeks philosophers considered the human body as just a prison, a prison, and they welcomed death as a deliverance from that bondage. But this skeptical attitude that Paul had to address was a very important issue because it affected every part of the human life, every part of the Christian life. So Paul said, i got to hit it head on, and he did so, and it's too important to ignore Matter of fact, and how Paul did this, and we're going to look at this today, is he did it by dealing with four basic questions that everybody needs to know about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you're taking notes, you'll see on the screen, here's the first of four questions that Paul raises. The first one is, are the dead raised? I mean, are people uh, that are made of flesh and bone, are they raised from the grave? Well, that's a good question. So it is important to point out that the believers at Corinth did believe in the resurrection of Christ. So Paul basically started his argument with that fundamental truth, but he presented three proofs, three proofs to assure his readers that Jesus Christ indeed had been raised from the grave. So we're going to walk through these proofs quickly. The first proof is of their salvation. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. You see, Paul had come to this city of Corinth and preached the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it transformed their lives. Their lives were being radically changed. And so as a result of that, he says, well, let me tell you, if you want to know if there's the resurrection of the dead, look what's happening in your own life. And that is a good question for all of us, is that when Christ entered your heart in your life, is there been a transformation taking place? And if there's been a transformation taking place, then you're experiencing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's, that's a powerful proof that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. See, these people believed in the gospel. They responded to the gospel by repenting of their sins. They confessed that Jesus is definitely the Christ, the Son of the living God. They were all baptized in the authority of Jesus Christ. And their salvation was assured. And he wanted to let them know that because of that, and what they've already experienced, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was real. And it did happen. You know, and that's one way for us to determine whether or not our faith is real. Is there change evident in our life? Are we just walking this thing called Christianity out with no transformation? So proof number one was that their salvation was evident to all. Proof number two is that the Old Testament scriptures, look at verses three and four. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. See, the Old Testament declared over and over again, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, even through the illustrations Jesus used of Jonah, to first fruits, to sacrifices that were made. Leviticus 16 speaks of that. Isaiah 53, Matthew 12, Psalm 16, 20, and others point to Christ's future resurrection. It was that powerful. It was that powerful. So the proof was that the Old Testament spoke of it. They knew that there had to be a conquering of death and of sin. And Jesus fulfilled that by being raised from the grave. And and proof number three is that Christ was seen by witnesses. Listen to what Paul says uh, in verses 5 through 11. He says, And that he, Christ, appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive 
Though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And then he says, last of all, as to be one untimely born, he appeared also to me. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. You want to know who the apostle Paul was? The one who believed in Jesus Christ, he was once formerly a religious terrorist. He went out there and he killed what he called the way, which we call Christians, the church. See, Paul had blood on his hands. But listen to what he says, though. But let's say this together. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. You know, I'm going to tell you something. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have accepted the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, people are going to still find your fears, faults, and failures, your hurts, hang-ups, and habits, and they're going to point them out. And you could say the same thing. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me is not in vain. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. That's what Paul's saying. And on the contrary, he says, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then, then it is with I or they, so we preached and so you believed. He says, God gets the glory. We took the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We proclaimed it with boldness and you believed. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world that he died on a cross, buried in a tomb, and on day three, he rose from the grave. If you lived at this time, you could still, and this is kind of a cool thought, you could still actually interview some of the people that were part of the 500 eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, can you imagine being transported back to that time? I mean, go back in your, uh, your memory for just imagination for just a little bit and picture yourself interviewing the two guys on the road of Emmaus. They're walking, and Jesus comes alongside them and walks with them. And he begins to uh, open up the Scriptures to them. And they're all discouraged and depressed, and where's God? I thought Jesus was better than this and bigger than that. And, uh, and he's just shaking his head. And he's kind of getting after them. Then he sits down, and he has dinner with them. And imagine interviewing him and asking him these questions like, did you actually see the resurrected Christ? And they said, oh, yes, we did. Matter of fact, he walked along the road, but we didn't recognize him then. It wasn't until we were having dinner with him that he unveiled his resurrection state. And he says, and imagine them saying, yes. And when he talked to us about the scriptures, our hearts burned within us when we were on the road. We knew it was something special about that guy. And I know that for a lot of us who have been walking the path with Christ, there's sometimes that the Word of God just burns something within us. And that is what is our testimony. It's a proof that there is a resurrected Savior living through our veins because our lives are never the same. They're in a constant state of change. But here's another question that Paul addresses, and that's number two. When are the dead raised? That's a good question. First of all, are dead people raised? We, yes, they are. But when are they raised? Paul uses three images to answer the question. The first image is the image of first fruits. Look at verses 20 and 23. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. To Christ. See, as the Lamb of God, Jesus died on Passover day. And the sheep of the first fruits, he rose from the dead three days later on the first day of the week. That's why we celebrate Easter on Sunday. The first day of the week, that's the day he rose from the grave. But you, like I said, you know what? To the Apostle Paul and to all the early church, every day was Resurrection Sunday. And every day should be Resurrection Sunday for us as well. But on the first day of the week, When the priests waved the sheaf of the first fruits before the Lord, it was a sign that the entire harvest belonged to him. When he was waving the sheaf, he said, The harvest is yours, Lord. The harvest is yours. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was God's assurance to us that we shall also be raised one day as a part of the future harvest. To believers, death is only sleep. 
Death is only sleep. The body sleeps, but the soul is at home with the Lord. And at the resurrection, the body will be awakened and the body will be glorified. It's going to be phenomenal. Matter of fact, I'm going to do my best to explain it in just a few moments, but the Bible says about what's this resurrected state going to look like? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived what God has in store for those who love Him. But here's the second. Here's the second one. That's Adam. He says here, verse 21 through 22, For as by man came death, thanks Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of, of the dead, thanks, thanks Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also Christ shall all be made alive. You see, Adam is the origin of death. He was the, the, the one who sinned that crossed death to come into the world, fear to enter the world. See, if you're afraid today, it's because it goes all the way back to the days of Adam and Eve when they did not trust God. And what they wanted instead of the, the relationship with God, they wanted to know everything else. They picked from the wrong tree. Instead of the tree of life, they pick from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And right now, believe it or not, you're going to feed your fear if you keep picking from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We need to stop right now and see this is a huge blessing that God has given us to start picking from the tree of life. I heard an illustration uh, not too long ago, but the fact that uh, we in this world, for the most part, we're like running on this proverbial treadmill that seems to get faster and faster and faster, and our lives are getting faster and faster and faster, and we're thinking that we have to run that fast in order to stay in tune with everything else, to get what I need to get, and to go where I need to go. But right now, God supernaturally shut off all the treadmills, and we now have to sit. And it's driving some of us crazy. But God says, don't see it as punishment so much as an opportunity to sit and be still and know that I'm God. God wants you to know who He is. Do you know Him? Are you trusting Him? Or are you riddled with fear and fight? See, God wants us not to live as Adam did, but to live as Christ did. And the next one is the kingdom. The kingdom, verses 24 through 28. He says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he, was, he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to, put to, to be destroyed is who? is death. See, death right now is causing everybody to panic. We're afraid to die for we fear where we're going to go. And Jesus said, I know I have to conquer death. And he did that through the resurrection. I have to conquer death so that you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be afraid. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says, he says, all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him, referring to God. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, God, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all and in all. God is in control. God's in control. He's in control. I know life's a little shaky right now. But the resurrection reminds us that God is in control. He's in control of your marriage. If you let Him be, He's in control of your family, your job, your health. If you let Him be, He don't want you out of control. He wants you in control because He's in control. That's what God wants. Then there's a third question that Paul addresses to the church of Corinth, and that is this. Why are the dead raised? We know they're raised. I know when they're going to be raised, but why are they raised? You see, the resurrection of the human body is a future event that has compelling implications for our personal lives. It really does. And if the resurrection is not true, if there was no resurrection, then we could forget about the future and we can live as we please. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then why are, am I even preaching to you right now what Paul is basically saying? But the resurrection is true. Jesus did raise from the dead, and he's coming back for us one day. 
Even if we die before he comes, we shall be raised at his coming and stand before him in a glorified body, in a glorified body. So Paul cites four areas of Christian experience that are impacted by the reality of the resurrection. Quickly, let's walk through those. First of all, to reach lost people. The resurrection is to reach lost people. Listen to what the, these people have done back then. Th- there was confusion. They knew there was power in the, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in the baptism of Jesus Christ. But they, they got a little off kilter. It says in verse 29, Otherwise, he's talking about what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead. If the dead are not raised at all, why are people being baptized on their behalf? Now, this is not a biblical practice. We are to practice. For whatever reason, they got off track, but they were thinking, man, you know, my grandpa wasn't baptized, or my grandma wasn't baptized, my sister, my my friend, so I better be baptized for them, because on that day, they'll be raised from the grave. And Paul said, if you didn't believe in the resurrection, why would you even do something like that? That's his question. But we're to reach the lost. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all things I have commanded you. And he says, and I'll be with you to the very end of time. And Jesus is with us during this time. So to reach the loss, also to suffering. Suffering. Verses 30 and 32. Why are we in danger every hour, Paul says. I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. Every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, if the dead are not raised? Let us drink, and for tomorrow we will die. He says, if there is no resurrection, then why would I even do these things? Why would all these people do these things? Why would the apostles be willing to die if Christ was not raised from the grave? See, that's what he's talking about. Why would we do these things? There's a much better life. Paul was kind of a... Yeah, heading towards what we would call the modern-day Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. And he was like, I was, I'm, I'm the best of the best. But he gave it all up because he witnessed the resurrected Christ. And he says there's no turning back. There's nothing greater than that. And also number, number four, ex- another Christian experience, and that is the separation from sin. Verses 34, I mean 33 and 34. He says, do not be deceived. Let's say this together. Bad company ruins good morals. You become who you hang around. Wake up from your drunken stupor as it is right and to do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Stop going to the ways of the world. Stop making decisions based on fear rather than faith. That's what he's basically saying. Live for truth. And be around people who live for truth. So you got to reach, we reach the loss. We, we, we deal with the suffering issue. We deal with separation from sin. And number four is this issue of death. This issue of death. Look at, starting with verse 49. It says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven, Jesus. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all be, ch- but we should all be changed in a moment, moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. I mean, can you imagine that? that you're just doing your daily activities and all of a sudden a sound of a trumpet like you've never heard it before, louder than you've ever heard. And it is now to be transformed from this earthly body to a heavenly body. Man, what a wonderful moment that will be. Verse 53 says, For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must be put on immortality. It says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Listen to this. This is what we'll be able to say with confidence. Remind ourselves on this day, on Resurrection Sunday, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Death, you have no hold on me because Jesus Christ rose from the grave. That's what the promise is. 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, if you were here, I'd take up an offering. What an awesome truth. Death is defeated. We don't have to live with the ramifications of death, live in fear anymore, because Jesus Christ raised from the grave. Okay, here's the fourth question that we're going to end on today, is how are the dead raised? How are the dead raised? Being philosophers, the Greek reason that the resurrection of the human body was, it was an impossibility. After all, when the body turned to dust, it became soil, which other bodies derived its nourishment. It becomes a little uh, kind of a tweaked right here, basically saying that the bodies that went back to dust, you grew your vegetables and fruits, and you, you grew them, and you ate them, and now you're eating somebody else. Kind of a big deal. In short, the food that was eaten was part of the elements of the bodies of generations long ago. When the body of the founder of Rhode Island, get this, Roger Williams was, was, was exhumed, it was discovered that roots of a nearby apple tree had grown through the coffin. Now get this, this founder of Rhode Island, body was exhumed, and all of a sudden they found out that nearby apple tree's roots got into the coffin. And it says, to some degree, the people who ate the apples partook in his body. That's what they were thinking. We ate, we ate this guy, Roger Williams. See, after the resurrection then, who will claim the various elements? That's what they were thinking. See, Paul's reply to this kind of reasoning was very blunt. He says, you fool, you fool. Then he made this important point that resurrection is not reconstruction. Get that. Resurrection is not reconstruction. Nowhere does the Bible teach us that at the resurrection, God will put together all the pieces and return to us our former bodies there is continuity, it is our body, but there's also, it is not identity, it is not the same body. See, we're, we're, this body we have now, it's falling apart, as you guys know. Man, do you get older, man, it's not going north, everything's going south, and we are not happy about that. We are spending billions a year to try to get going back north again. It's not working, is it? You can see that in Hollywood. You can see that in Hollywood. But God's going to give us a new body for the dimensions of eternity, not earthly. The conclusion is this, if God is able to make a different kinds of bodies for men, for animals, for birds and fish, and he can also make a different kind of body for us at the resurrection, at the resurrection. So Paul knew that such miracles cannot be explained, so he used three analogies to make the teaching clear, and here he did. He said, in the area of seeds, look what he says, starting with verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Basically, it's like a seed. A seed will have to go on the ground. It has to die, then life comes out of that. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a barrel kernel, perhaps, of wheat or some other grain. But God gives a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed his own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown and is a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. He says, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth and the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And is the man of heaven through also those who are in heaven. So that means that when we get to heaven, you short people will become tall. And you tall people will become short. That's what some people say to me. See, I don't know if that's true, but I will tell you this, that you will not be lacking anything. You see, before the fall of man, or after the fall of man, there was only 31 flavors of ice cream. But you know, one day when Jesus comes back and, and we get to go back to heaven, there's not 31 flavors of ice cream, folks. There's 3,100 flavors of ice cream. And it's good for you. And broccoli's bad for you. See, that's the whole idea. It's so different. Everything went south when Adam sinned. So seeds was analogy number one. Flesh was analogy number two. Verse 39, 
For not all flesh is the same. Would you circle that? Not all flesh is the same. But there are one kind of humans, and uh, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Which means you see all these different things. So there's a uniqueness with this. So he wants to make the teaching clear. He says, as you can see, you know, your cat doesn't look like you, and you don't look like your dog, and you don't, don't look like your fish. And he says, and also heavenly bodies, another analogy, aren't the same. He says, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly, heavenly is one of a kind, and the glory of the earthly is, is of another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for the stars differ from star to star. Saying that it's so different out there. And that's going to be like you. When you get your new resurrected, glorified body, you're going to be unique, but different. Not only are there are earthly bodies, but there are also heavenly bodies. And they differ from one another. In fact, the heavenly bodies differ from each other, and you can see that through our solar system, and it just goes on and on and on. See, these illustrations today, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, may not answer every question that you have about the resurrection of the body, but they do give us the assurances that we need. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, then you can be assured that on the last day, that when He comes and He busts through the clouds, The dead in Christ will rise first. And all those who are alive will be caught up in the air to be together with the Lord forever. What a promise. That's why the resurrection is so powerful. That's why during this time, God wants us to focus on the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know, I will tell you that uh, if we do not have hope, during times like this, or any struggle we face, then we will not be able to cope with anything in our life. Because you need hope to cope. You need hope to cope. And let me ask you a question today as we close. Do you have hope of assurance of your salvation in Jesus Christ, who's been raised from the grave, that if you were to die tonight, you would know exactly where you'd go? You see, Christ gives us this offer to do so. And here he tells us, you've got to believe the gospel that he died, buried, and rose again. And that you believe that he is Christ, the son of the living God. You repent of your sins. Quit being governed by fear and start being led by faith. Then you confess that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know what the cool part about Scripture is that when you're ready to be baptized because you believe those things, you know, you go find some water where you can be immersed in and you can have somebody immersed in. And here's how simply you do it. You ask them the question, those who are believers, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? And says, yes, I do. And based on your confession, you you grab them, you say, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ in baptism, Romans 6, raised to walk in a brand new life. Man, freshly redeemed. Freshly redeemed. Resurrection. See, resurrection's in everything. That's why God wants us to focus on Him today. Amen? Well, we love you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for all that you have done. Father, we thank you for Resurrection Sunday. Father, we thank you that um, you've given us like chapters 15 of 1 Corinthians that clears up so much. Father, we know that our earthly body is wasting away. It is being governed by fear, but yet faith in Jesus Christ and in the power of the resurrection, we could be transformed to one degree of glory to the next. We don't have to be governed by fear anymore. We can live by faith and in His power and in a sound mind. And Father, love is what we're supposed to be about. To love you is to obey you, Father. To love our neighbors ourselves is to find ways to serve them. May we be found faithful. And we thank you so much for the power of the resurrection. And it's your name we pray. And everybody said, amen.